I'm going to ask Jim if you'd like to come and read for us. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to be reading from Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 14, reading from verse 1. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, Sophie's going to come and preach to us today. So just going to pray for you. Lord, we, we thank you for Sophie and who she is, Lord. And I just pray that what she has prepared with you to share with us today, Lord, would just do us all good um, from your amazing word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Maria. Morning, everyone. Oh, that was a good, was a good morning, wasn't it? It's not what my students say. <laughs> I stand at the door, this isn't to do with my talk, I stand at the door and I go, bonjour, 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 or if it's hello, hola. Most of them just, mm, mm, hummus. <laughs> so that was great, that's a nice change. Um, yeah, hello. Um, thank you, Jim, for reading that passage today. <clears throat> so Mark 14, um, verses 1 to 11. So as you know, it's Easter next week, and we just thought it'd be good to have uh, some space uh, to it to kind of reflect on Jesus' last moments before the, the crucifixion. And particularly this account of when Jesus was anointed by this woman. A um, very famous passage, I'm sure you've heard it before, the alabaster jar. And lots of things could be said about this. Um, I was really, I really wanted to speak about how counterculture it was about women. Um, it's just amazing, but there's not enough time. Um, there's loads of things we could talk about it. But I wanted to look at this passage this morning and see it as a picture of what it means to worship Jesus. And I think we can all agree, can't we, that worship is such an important part of our lives, it's an important part of our, our Sundays, but it can be a really tricky thing to speak on. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to define. So on the one hand, we can say worship is our whole lives, isn't it? Um, which is true but it can be a bit vague. <laughs> like, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and on the other hand, you know, when, when I say worship, when we say worship, a lot of us think, oh, like, that's when we sing. That's like the singing part in our church service, which, again, is, is true. I think there's something really valuable when we all come together and corporately sing praises to God. But the challenge with that <laughs> is that we have so many different opinions on what sung worship should be, don't we? Even in our one church here, if I was to ask you, right, everyone, write down your preferences, <laughs> you know, like we, we, we differ so much, wouldn't we? Some of us would like modern songs, some of us would prefer hymns, some of us would want a mixture of both. Um, you know, we, we differ on how long we sing for. I always laugh. My mum said to me that when, um, when she goes to heaven, 
she, um, she's going to be the one sitting in the corner. When everyone else is repeating the chorus over and over and over and over again, she's just going to be reading her book in the corner. She doesn't, she doesn't like, I remember, I don't know, she's probably listening to this now. Um, but I remember her saying, hi, mum. <laughs> I remember her saying that, yeah, that it's not something she, she likes, like when we repeat the chorus over and over again. Um, we would differ on the instruments that we, we play as well, and loads of other things. Um, so it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to speak on about worship. But in this passage, when we get this woman pouring out this alabaster jar, which we'll see in a minute why that's an act of worship, we get less a theological definition of worship and more a picture of the kind of worship that Jesus describes as beautiful. And so we see the act of worship not as something that blesses us, not as something that is for us, well, I prefer this and I prefer that, but rather as something that God himself, the creator of the universe, says that is beautiful. And I really want to explore what that means. Like, what does beautiful worship look like? So I want to look at three things. Uh, Firstly, worship is for Jesus. Secondly, worship is an offering. And thirdly, worship is a sign. So firstly, worship is for Jesus. I know it sounds really obvious, but it's, it's a really good place to start, isn't it? At its heart, this, this act, this woman, when she was pouring out this alabaster jar, it was, it was an act directly for Jesus, and it was directed at Jesus. In verse 6, he says, she has done a beautiful thing to me. You know, that emphasis is, it, it's for me, it, it's, she did it to me. And Mark appears to draw, not that Mark, other Mark, appears to draw a contrast between the women and Judas, doesn't he? At the end of the passage in verse 10, we read that that Judas seems to be more um, acting, he seems to be looking at Jesus more for his own benefit. Like he wants some money, doesn't he? He wants to, he wants to get some reward for him. In verse 10, it says, then Judas, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So, as I said, Judas appears to be moved more by money, something that he can gain from, whereas the woman is focused on Jesus himself. And I think it can be really easy, can't it, when we're thinking about worship, um, particularly when it's sung worship, um, is to think or to speak about it as something that it, is for us. You know, like if I was to say to you this morning, oh, how, how did you find worship this morning? Um, I imagine our answers would differ on whether we liked the songs, um, whether we liked the style, how long we sung for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and by the way, as someone who leads worship myself, I think I have a right to say that as well. Um, But it's telling, isn't it, in the passage that Jesus sees worship as something done for him. It's actually got nothing to do with us. As I said in verse 6, she has done a beautiful thing to me. And there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a preferred style of worship. There is nothing wrong either with asking God to, to give us things. You know, he's a good father who wants to give us good gifts. And yet, there is something really special about what this woman is doing, pouring out this perfume to Jesus that is purely, solely, unquestionably for Jesus and only for Jesus. You know, they're having dinner, it's the hustle and bustle of life and we know that passage as well with Mary and Martha, don't we? Like there's busyness. Um, and she, she takes the time out to go out of this hustle and bustle, out of the crowd. You know, she would have had to find her way in. Um, and she, she wants to find Jesus. She takes time out of her day to find him and then to give him her pure, undivided, genuine attention. And I think it's really challenging. You know, when, when we worship God, Do we worship him for what he can give us or for who he is? Do we pursue his presence or his gifts? And I think personally for me, when when I am singing on a Sunday uh, Sunday morning, I find it easier to worship him for his presence. You know, like, Lord, come here, bless, you know. 
But what does worship look like when life is really tough and God hasn't given you the stuff that you want or your, your parents are ill, <laughs> you know, and they get sick or your children get sick or lots of other things we could think of. Do we seek his presence rather than what he can give us? And what I find amazing is Jesus' response. We've said it already, but in verse 6, he says, she has done a beautiful thing. Like just, just, just think about that for a second. The creator of the universe, the one who, who creates the beautiful sunsets, the creator of stars, the whole universe. He sees our worship when it's for him, not for us. When we do things for him, you know, the way we behave at work, the way we talk to our family and our friends. He, he doesn't see that as a, as a means to get attention or to get reward. When we do it for him, he, he sees that as beautiful. I just think it's amazing. It's absolutely incredible. Surely he's, he's the one that we're calling beautiful and he's glorious and he, he deserves the praise. But no, he's calling our worship when it's purely for him. He calls that beautiful. I think that's amazing. So firstly, worship is for Jesus. Secondly, worship is an offering. One of the simplest points to make about this passage is that this woman breaking this alabaster jar, she's offering it, isn't she? It's a gift, it's an offering. But it's costly. It's a really costly offering. And there's three reasons why it's costly. The first one is that she went against societal norms. You know, it's very easy to read this passage and, and forget the role of women in the society and, and to forget how countercultural she is being. You know, at that time in society, just in general, public displays of affection, especially towards a teacher like Jesus or a religious figure like Jesus, were not common. Like, that was not normal. <laughs> and touching or anointing someone in this way would have been viewed as inappropriate or even scandalous. You know, it was really unusual for a woman to approach a rabbi or a teacher. You know, they're, they're kind of deemed... There was a bit of a hierarchy, wasn't there? Um, women were kind of classed more in the domestic roles, and so they weren't really seen as equals uh, in religious or, or public settings. So this was quite shocking, what she did. She is breaking societal boundaries of gender, social status, religious conventions. She is completely disregarding expectations of what a woman should be and how they should behave because her love for Jesus is way more important and I just that's really bold isn't it like when I think of my week how have I been countercultural? how have I gone against what society thinks and how I should behave and I was also thinking this, like, she, she would have known, wouldn't she? She would have known, because of these expectations of women on, on society, from society, she would have known that people were going to look at her and say nasty things and ridicule her and mock her. Like, she would have known that before she went into that house and said to herself, right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pour this alabaster jar on Jesus. Like, she would have known that she would have been ridiculed, and she did it anyway. It's not mentioned in this version, but in Luke's version, um, he quotes Simon saying, if this man were a prophet, this is a horrible thing to say, Simon says, if this man were a prophet, obviously talking about Jesus, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. Like she would have heard that, pouring out that jar, and she did it anyway. She probably would have been crying. Like it was really costly she would have known that people were going to criticize her. The second thing, the reason why it was costly was because it just purely it was, it was expensive. You know, in verse three, we're told that the perfume was very expensive and made of pure nard. This is, um, um, I looked this up, I didn't know this, but apparently this perfume um, is a plant that was only grown in India, which is obviously, you know, really far away from Israel, which is why it was really expensive. And one commentary I read also said that the value of the perfume and its kind of identification with nard suggests that it was a family heirloom, you know, being passed from one generation to another, from mother to daughter, from mother to daughter. This was a highly expensive and precious gift. And she offered it to Jesus. The last reason why it was costly was because not just the value of it, but the amount she was giving to God. In verse 3, it says, she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. She poured 
the perfume on his head. Imagine it starting off in the head, flowing down, going into his beard, then down the shoulders, then through his cloak. It probably would have had a puddle on, on the floor. Like She poured everything of this jar, the way it was designed and you know, the jar itself. Once you break that jar, like everything's going to come out. You can't say to yourself, oh, I'll keep a little bit. And then you can have the rest, Jesus. Like she had to give everything to Jesus. So three reasons why it was costly. She went against society norms. It was expensive and costly for her. And the amount she gave to Jesus. And again, we should be really challenged by her boldness. What do we value most in life? I heard um, someone do a talk on this, and he summed up his talk in this question. What's the most costly thing for you to give to Jesus today? What's the most costly thing for you to give to Jesus today? Is it family? Is it children? Health? A dream job? financial security, maybe something else. Because worship isn't this theological abstract thing. It's an extravagant offering and it's an exquisite lavish on to Jesus. You've probably heard this verse before, but in Romans 12, it says, therefore I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And I think that really echoes the passage today, doesn't it? It's not, worship is not a song that we sing. Um, it's not when we raise our hands in the air. It's our whole lives, you know, how we behave on a Monday morning, how we behave on a Thursday afternoon. We sang the song earlier, um, Receive Our Adoration. I noted down the lyrics, it says, You have our hearts, Lord, take our lives. Like That's the offering, our whole lives. Worship is about offering everything we have. And yes, it is costly. It is so costly at times. You know, we think about our jobs, our relationships, our homes, our finances. We give that all to God. And I said at the beginning, it can be a bit vague, can't it, to to kind of say worship is our whole lives. So what does that look like? Well, for me as a teacher, secondary school, if you didn't know, um, you know, when I go to school on a Monday morning or Friday morning or whatever, I could pray, and it's very tempting to do this. I could pray, oh, God, just help me get through today. Help me get through my year seven. (gasps) Challenging class. It used to be year nine. It's year seven now. Um, I could say that. And, and, you know, there's, there's there's nothing really wrong about that. But if I want to offer my job as an act of worship, an offering, a costly offering, it'd be better for me to say, God, this is my job. This is my day. Like, I give it to you. This is, I'm a teacher. Like, what can I do to serve you? What can I do to worship you today? And it might mean that I sit with a colleague after school, got loads of marking to do, but there's a colleague who's, who's clearly upset, and I'm going to sit with him or her, and I'm just going to listen, and I'm going to be that encouraging person. Um, maybe it's the time um, you take to stop on your way to work. You see this homeless person on the road, and you stop and talk to them. Maybe it's about your finances. You know, society might tell us to buy certain things that promise security or beauty or significance. And we do. We get those messages all the time, don't we? Subconsciously, all the time, on the phone, internet, TV, radio, all the time. And maybe worship is more about, God, this is my money. It's actually your money. This is my offering to you. What do you want me to do with this money? It's yours. So let's just pause and reflect every aspect of our lives. Is there one aspect that we're giving to God more than another? Are we holding on to something too tightly? Do we need to loosen our grip? This woman, I've said it already, but it's worth repeating, she gave in an extravagant way, costly way, but it was an extravagant. Everything fell out of that jar to Jesus. Do we need to be reminded this morning, and I'm, I'm talking about me as well here, do we need to be reminded that worship is our whole lives, we give our whole lives to God? So firstly, worship is for Jesus. Secondly, worship is, um, is an offering. And thirdly, worship is a sign. 
I think it's really easy to see worship, I've mentioned already, something for us or, or maybe for us and God. Um, but she is doing something that actually is a sign for three things. So firstly, it's a sign for how much she values Jesus. You know, you could argue, why on earth was she pouring out so extravagantly? A few years ago, I, I, um, I had a chat with my friend. She's a really close friend. She's not a Christian. And I remember having, um, I can't tell if it was <laughs> a challenging or an encouraging talk or both. <laughs> she knows I'm a Christian. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky that I can, that she's quite open to Christianity. She's quite open to faith. Um, and we would, I can't remember what we were talking about specifically. But I remember telling her how important Jesus is in my life. And she said to me, so, so, so Jesus is more important than your husband. Jesus is more important than your, than your family. And I was like, yeah, yeah, he is. And she, um, she really struggled with that. Like she couldn't, um, she said, oh, I, just, I, couldn't, I could never do that. And I'm, I'm still praying for her. I hope that she realizes how infinitely greater God is um, than every part of our lives. But it is, isn't it? When we act, when we worship, it is an act. It's a sign that Jesus is so valuable. You know, the people around the woman in verse four and five, they say, why this waste? Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And it says they rebuked her harshly. And you could argue my friend was doing that. She was like, why? Surely your, your husband is more important. Surely your, your parents are more important. Like, I'm not saying they're not important. <laughs> I'm just saying that Jesus is more important. And also... Maybe she was missing something that I'm entrusting those things to Jesus. Like, what better place to to give those things to Jesus? Like, yeah, this this is my these are my relationships, God. I give them to you. Like, what can you do with them? You know, I think she was seeing it as they're they're less important. And but in my eyes, like amazing things can happen through that. You know, my, my marriage is, is a blessing because we both know Jesus and we both take things to Jesus. Like it's such a huge blessing when we give those things to Jesus. And I don't know about you, but when I first read this, this verse, when they said, why this waste of perfume? I was like, yeah, <laughs> that sounds pretty reasonable. <laughs> like, yeah, like it's so, if it's so expensive, imagine what she could have done with that money to the poor. And as I thought about it, and we actually talked about it in home group, you know, what is Jesus saying here? He is saying that there is something more important, more precious than helping the poor or anything else for that matter. What could that be? Jesus himself. I, I um, follow this guy called John Thurlow on, on Instagram. He's a, he's a worship leader in America. And he sends a newsletter every week to kind of worship, um, to encourage worship leaders. And something jumped out to me last week. Um, he posted, worship doesn't start with a song. It starts with what you see. The worship song is not what starts the worship. What starts the worship is when we behold Jesus. The worship song is the response to beholding Jesus as he is. The reason why the woman was prepared to be ridiculed, prepared to be mocked, prepared to go against society is because she could see Jesus for who he is. There were loads of people there with Jesus. They were physically present with him, but she was the one who saw him for who he was, the most precious thing in her life. That's why she was prepared to give that offering, that costly offering. You know, that breaking of the expensive gift was not a waste when she poured it all over Jesus, because he was infinitely more valuable than anything else. When we worship God, it's a sign that says, Jesus, you are infinitely more valuable than anything else in my life. And as I was preparing this talk, I, th I thought maybe we need a reminding of that. You know, when Paul says in Philippians, everything else is a loss compared to the surpassing worth of Jesus. Maybe we need reminding of Jesus' worth in our lives. So firstly, it's a sign that Jesus is infinitely more valuable than anything else. Secondly, it's a sign for others. In verse 9, Jesus says, truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. 
I'm not sure the woman knew <laughs> that what she was going to do would be talked about and preached on and remembered for years and years and years to come. That this act of worship would go beyond her. And sometimes our acts of worship can seem really small, can't they? And so insignificant, but they really matter. They really matter to God. As we offer our lives as a daily act of worship, and yet it can seem really small. God, my year sevens are in front of me. What, what can I do? Maybe it's just about giving a little bit more attention to that student who's feeling really rubbish. And that can seem like a really insignificant part of my day, but it matters. It matters to God. And all those, you know those picture books? You know when like you have that page and then it's a, it's a drawing and then you flick to the next page and it looks almost like the exact same drawing and the next one and the next one. And so if you were to look at your life one day at a time, it probably, maybe, would seem quite insignificant. But when you flick that book, you know those books I'm talking about? Like when you flick it, I can't think what they're called. Like then you see the picture moving like this really, really fast. And I, I think that's what God sees when he looks at our lives and our daily act of worship. They all add up, don't they? And then it's this beautiful picture of how we've given everything to God. So let's think, you know, when people come to our church, do they see our passion for Jesus? Is, is our worship a sign for others that Jesus is infinitely more valuable? In our relationships, in our families, particularly with those people who aren't Christians, do our lives show that we love Jesus and put him first. And the last sign is that it, it points to Jesus himself. Again, quite an obvious point. But ultimately, the reason why we worship is because we believe that God deserves the praise, don't we? We believe that he deserves all the glory, all the honor. We worship him because he lavishly poured out his life for us. Just like the woman broke that jar, lavishly giving it to Jesus. He did that to us when he was sent to the cross, when he died. In Ephesians 5, in the message version, it says, Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious. I love this phrasing. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. That screams to me, the woman with the alabaster jar. She didn't love in order to get something from Jesus, but to give everything of herself to God. And we should want to worship extravagantly, to offer our whole lives to him. If anything, as, as to say thank you, you know, because he, he died for us, particularly as we think of Easter next week. In the NIV version, it says uh, of Ephesians 5, live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering. See the link with the woman? Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In verse 8, Jesus says, she poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I've saying that word wrong with Matt yesterday. I'm in English, second language, burial, burial. Burial. I keep saying burial. Um, so Jesus knew that he was going to die. And he, he knew that he was going to die. And so this woman, whether she knew it or not, she was prophetically preparing Jesus for when he himself would be a fragrant offering. Like he knew that was going to happen. And when that woman broke the alabaster jar, there would have been a beautiful smelling aroma in the house. It probably would have stayed with Jesus when he left that house that day. And I, I think, we don't know, I think it would have comforted him as he went to the cross. So Jesus was a fragrant offering. That's why we worship. It's because he did it for us. So I'm just going to draw things to a close now and I want us to think about this week coming up as we prepare for Easter. It's going to be really easy to let life go past us, isn't it? But let's remember this woman with the alabaster jar whose act of worship reminds us that worship is beautiful when it's for Jesus, when it's an offering, sometimes costly, of our lives. And when it's a sign that points to Jesus. Let's pray.
Father, thank you so much for your word and this beautiful story. Lord, thank you that you look at us and you see our our acts of worship. When we do it for you, Lord, you see it as beautiful. And Lord, it is so hard sometimes to give us, um, to give you our lives. Some things more than others. Perhaps now we might answer that question. What's the most costly thing you could give to Jesus today? And Lord, we, we lay this costly thing at your feet. It might be really hard, but we lay it at your feet knowing that you are the best person to give this to. You will keep it safe. And Lord, we pray that you would use this offering for your glory, whatever that looks like. And Father, we just want to say sorry for when we focus more on what you can give us rather than for who you are. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, would you remind us, remind us of who you are, the King of Kings, Prince of Peace, our Saviour, our Healer. Lord, we worship you for who you are. And we finally, Lord, just pray for this coming week. We offer our jobs, our finances, our relationships, our families, our children, everything, Lord, we offer these things all to you as an offering. And we pray that this week you would help us really on a practical level to worship you with these things, to put you as number one. And we pray that our acts of worship, our daily acts of worship would be a sign for those around us to see just how valuable and precious and infinitely greater you are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.